Oh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Glad to have you here with us this morning in the month of December. Let's join together in singing our opening hymn this morning, Angels We Have Heard on High. Stand with me, please. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Inspire your heavenly song. Please, Father God, thank you for the opportunity to be here together this morning, and particularly at this time of year, when our thoughts turn to the precious gift that you gave, your Son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for that this morning, and we pray for our services in Jesus' name. Amen. Please see it. We have a video that we're going to show you, and then Give Van Gilder will come up and give an announcement. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Well, shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night.
to see what we accomplish each year with Operation Christmas Child. So I just love watching these videos and seeing all that has taken place over the season. Thank you so, so much for your generous hearts and your passion to pack and to pray and to just be a part of this amazing ministry. Some of the numbers that you did see up there, super exciting. Yay, Trinity, we packed 131 shoe boxes. So give an amen and a big clap. Our youth um, also packed many of those, about 35, 40 of those shoe boxes. And then a note in your bulletin as well, six of those boxes were packed, uh, those were online shoe boxes, which is incredible, which I mentioned before, those particular boxes go to what we call restricted nations. So they're packed specifically to countries that are harder to bring the gospel to. So super excited about that. Our drop-off center this year collected 1,504 shoe boxes for Casa Grande and the surrounding areas. So give a big amen to that and a big clap to that. So that was up over about 105 shoe boxes from last year. It's the biggest year we've had so far as being a drop-off center location. So yay, CG. <laughs> um, and then for our South Mountain team, 16,020. That was our latest number at the end of collection week. But of course, that number goes up as we bring more to Processing Center. But just incredible numbers this year. So, so grateful to, again, the passionate people that pack shoe boxes and just generous hearts to give. One other quick little note is the prayer card that's in your bulletin as well. So just remember to be in prayer for all that's taking place. A lot happens behind the scenes after we collect all those shoe boxes at our processing centers and how they get shipped around the world. And then, of course, the local churches and communities that distribute these shoe boxes to the children and their families. So again, over the six, next six to nine months, these boxes will be you know, being delivered. So just be in prayer of most importantly for these precious children that each receive these shoe boxes. Hear the good news, the love of Christ, the hope that it can bring to their lives, and then the families that it's always going to reach as well. So there's just this domino effect. So Anyways, again, amazing year, and I could not have done this project <laughs> without the many, many hands that make this work so light and such a joy to do. Those of you that have served with me and volunteered, I love you so much. <laughs> so thank you so much for... Um, manning our table and talking about shoebox packing and those of you that came and served at the drop-off center that loaded boxes that um, made food that helped with our training just every little detail so important I appreciate you all so very much and um, just a joy to serve with you and just a pleasure to just have that time and, and just share in this wonderful opportunity ministry. So again, just want to say thank you again for your generous hearts, your passion to pack shoe boxes and bless children around the world. Thanks and God bless you guys. Merry Christmas. And thank you for your leadership this year again in Operation Christmas Child, quite a success. Well, if you happen to be with us worshiping for the very first time this morning, right in the pew in front of you is a visitor's card. We'd ask that you fill that out, if you would, and then drop it in the offering box in the foyer on your way out, and we'll appreciate that. And if you just identify yourself to our pastor, he'll be standing out there. He has a great new, uh, it's a 
visitor's bag, really what it is, and he'd like to give that to you. So if you just let him know that on your way out this morning. Well, our stewardship committee has completed its work in drafting a proposed 2022 budget for our church. And the uh, budget has been printed. It's available for you on the table on your way out if you'd like that. And this is the first of, uh, it's actually the second announcement, but we'll be announcing again next uh, Sunday of a special called business meeting on Wednesday, the 22nd of December over in the AEC building to consider adoption of the proposed 2022 budget. And we hope you're able to join us there at that time. And if you get your budget, you have any questions, be sure to call the church office and we'll get you an answer. With that, let's stand together and sing What Child Is This? What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, who angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping this, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in sense gold and myrrh compares and king to own him the king of kings salvation brings let loving hearts enthrone him this this is christ the king whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Great to sing old Christmas carols at Christmas time, certainly. And the next one is one of those good Christian men rejoice. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say. News, news, Jesus Christ is born today. Ox and ass before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today, Christ is born today. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye hear of endless bliss, joy, joy. Jesus Christ was born for this. He has opened heaven's door, and man is blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Peace, peace, Jesus Christ was born to save. Calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting all. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to save. Now come all ye faithful. Come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and 
us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord, sing choirs of angels, sing in exultation. Oh, sing all ye bright hosts of heaven above. Glory to God all, glory in the highest. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning, Jesus to Let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Rise the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> Don't you love those songs, y'all? Amen. Well, I'm going to ask uh, if Nathal and Mike Fanning would come up. They're going to light the Advent candle, the pink one. I'm going to give you a, a microphone, and they're going to light the pink candle, which represents the shepherds and joy. They're going to be reading from Luke uh, 2, 8 through 10. And here is the lighter right here. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Now I can back off. <laughs> no. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Let me, let me open up in a word of prayer. Thank you very much, Michael, as we uh, prepare our hearts to celebrate uh, Christmas. Uh, we look forward to the joy. We hopefully are li living the joy and, and seeing the joy of our salvation our day. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for these simple verses, but yet, Lord, we, we know that with great anticipation, not only do we celebrate Christmas here in a couple weeks, but even more so, we look forward to the return, the second advent of Christ, our Savior. Because we know, Lord, you're coming back. And Lord, we ask that uh, this morning you would speak to our hearts, that you would have a special word for each of us as we consider this question, who am I really in Christ? Speak to our hearts, Lord, in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, if you would, you know, we're continuing our study of the book of Acts, and you'll notice that this is actually, even though we're, we're coming out of Acts 18 going into Acts 19, this is the, the 30th sermon in this series. And some people might ask, why does it take? 30 weeks to just get to chapter 19. And the simple answer is because Paul was doing so much, and other believers as well, but the, the, the book of Acts is full of the Acts of the Apostles, and, and they were about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so it's not one of those things that you just rush through, you, you unpack that. And actually, if you open up your heartbeat, you'll notice that the question of the week is, who are you? And if you think about that, I want you to really meditate on that question. Who are you? Who am I really in Christ? Who are you? Let that kind of thought, maybe if you're taking notes, write down some, some thoughts as we work our way through this message. And I'm going to actually start in Matthew 7. So if you want to turn in your Bible there, the reason is because Matthew, Jesus Christ in Matthew, he gives us some real good pointers as to what a follower of Christ isn't, right? Or who people who claim to be Christians but aren't. What, what does that look like? So let's take a look. We're going to start there, Matthew 7, starting in verse 15. It says this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that, has, that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then the key verse here in verse 20, so you'll recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. You see, this question, who am I? As followers of Jesus Christ or as the church, are we naming the name of Jesus just because our forefathers named the name of Jesus? Or are we naming the name of Jesus because we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? It's not enough to just name, me, name Jesus because somebody else knows Jesus. It's not enough to name Jesus because our ancestors knew Jesus. It's not enough to name Jesus because our grandparents knew Jesus. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Who are you? You see, in this world, there's this, there's this vast spiritual wasteland. Well, sure, on, on one hand, there is that narrow road of people who know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior and are known by him. Because you notice that he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, they could name the name of Jesus, but he didn't know them. And so on the one hand, there are people who know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, and they are known by him. It's that narrow path, authentic followers of Jesus Christ. And on the other hand, there are the, those that are used specifically and intentionally for say They know that they don't believe in God, and they're proud of it, and they persecute the church. You have that. But in the middle is this vast spiritual wasteland. And these people in Matthew 7, they're in that spiritual wasteland. Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? We don't know how many people are in that spiritual wasteland. They think they know Jesus, but Jesus doesn't know them. We don't know the percentage, it's an X, X percentage. Well, we know about 5% of Christians will share the gospel so that somebody else comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So does that mean 95% of people who claim to be Christians, churchgoers, aren't authentic Christians? Probably not, that's probably too high. We know that 20% of people in the church actually do 80% of the work of the church. So maybe it's 80% of Christians aren't authentic believers and they're in that spiritual wasteland. No, that's probably not the number. We don't know. But there is this massive, this massive spiritual wasteland. Only about 50% of people who go to church go to any type of Bible study, a Sunday school or a life group. Maybe it's 50%. Nobody knows. And I would say to you this morning, I would say to me, I would say to all of us this morning, the percentage of people that are 
called Christians that call themselves Christians that are in that spiritual wasteland. That they're the ones that have cast out demons, so to speak. They're the ones that name Jesus. They're the ones that go to church. But Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you when they breathe their last breath. The, the reality is that percentage doesn't matter. What matters is, do you know Jesus Christ? And is, are you known by him? The percentage, we could go the last 2,000 years and, and try to calculate the percentage of Christians that were in this massive spiritual wasteland. They thought they knew, but they didn't. And friend, it doesn't matter. What matters is, are you known by Jesus? That is the only statistic that matters. Because it has your name attached to it. And so I go back to this question, who are you? Who are you in Christ? But there are people who think they're all that and then some. And one day, Jesus will say, I know you mentioned my name, but I actually don't know you. Then there's another group within this spiritual wasteland. And these are the people that really, really think they're all that in a box of chocolates. Take a look, if you would, Matthew 23, verse 15 and following. There's this other group in this spiritual wasteland. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as fit for hell as you are. Verse 23 and following. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, yet gulp down a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the outside of the cup, so the outside of it may also become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and every impurity. In the same way, on the outside you see righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Y'all, that is really, really tough. These are not people who are going around saying, I am serving Satan and persecuting the church. These are people who are going around saying, we are the spiritual elites. In Matthew 23, Matthew 7, those are the people who are going out. They're naming the name of Jesus. But yet they're in this spiritual wasteland. He says, on the outside you appear to be good with God, but on the inside you're full of dead men's bones. It'd be like kind of, i put a, a, an analogy, a metaphor. Is you go to a, let's say, a botanical garden or a nursery, and you, and you see a cup that says mesquite tree seedling, and inside you can see that they put a little seed in there. And you add water to it, and a few months later, this pops up, a cactus. But on the outside, it said mesquite tree. It's like, that's not a mesquite tree. That's a cactus. Well, yeah, but, but on the outside. And Jesus said, it doesn't matter what it says on the outside. You got to wait till it bears fruit. You got to see what it produces. See, how are we known by Christ? Well, it's not by what it says on the outside. It's not by if if I carry my Bible to church. It's not if I have a Jesus sticker on my bumper of my car. There are a whole bunch of other things you can think of. But see, if this says mesquite tree and out pops a cactus, that seed didn't turn into a cactus seed. It was always a mesquite tree seed. As a follower of Christ, or as individuals, let's just back up, as an individual, we have to ask ourselves that question. Who am I really? 
And the answer is not contingent upon what is on the outside. It's not what I say of myself or others say of me. It's what God says of me. It's who am I really? Who are you? This is the question we need to ask ourselves in these days as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Who am I? And so we go to Paul. We're going back now to Acts, and we'll pick up the end of Acts 18. And why we spend so much time, and we've been spending time, 30 weeks to be exact, why we've been spending so much time looking at Acts, and especially Paul, is because Paul wasn't just a Christian on the outside. He was an authentic believer on the inside. He didn't just know Jesus. He was known by Jesus. And because of that, he never gave up. He was, he was always engaging the world. Wherever he went, he was engaging the world. Because that's who he was. This cactus will never be a mesquite tree. I'm not even sure how good of a cactus it's going to be. Partly because it's at our house, and that obviously puts it at a detriment right there. But it will always be a cactus. And Paul was always a follower of Jesus Christ. And we could carry the metaphor even farther, which is really just a beautiful message for us. Because the point of today, even though we started out with, well, that's really a brutal thing, right? There are people who think they're Christian. They even do amazing things, but God's going to say, depart from me. But actually, the whole point of this message, actually, it, there's a beautiful encouragement in it. Within the church, within Christendom, there are people who preach, teach, evangelists, people who have just are good at acts of mercy. We all don't have to be a mesquite tree or a redwood tree. Part of the beauty of being a follower of Christ is taking this analogy further before we get into look at Paul's life and why he just never gave up. This cactus is a good cactus if it does what a cactus is supposed to do. You see, if it lives according, if it thrives according to its form, it can't be criticized for not being a redwood. And as a follower of Christ, if your spiritual giftedness, if, if God's call in your life is, is you are that that ambassador of mercy. God will never say to me, will never say to you, depart from me because you weren't a preacher. You weren't a redwood or you weren't a mosquito or you weren't a cactus. You know what I'm saying? You lived according to the assignment I gave you, whatever that is. This cactus doesn't need to be a redwood tree to be valuable and worthful. It needs to be what it was designed to be. And I need to be, and you need to be. We need to be. But the question is, who are you? Are you in Christ? And does Jesus know you? So let's take a look. The first point, if you have your, your outline there in your heartbeat. I labeled it, or I titled it, On the Road Again. Because that's what Paul was always doing. He was living. This cactus is going to act like a cactus because it's a cactus. Its form determines what it's going to be. And Paul was formed in the image of Jesus Christ. And because of that, he acted, he lived out, out of the form, that is, as a Christian, a follower of Christ, authentically known by Jesus Christ. And so Paul, verse 18 of Acts 18, so Paul, having stayed on for many days, said goodbye to the brothers and sailed away to Syria. Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He shaved his head at Centrea because he had taken a vow. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue. And what did he do? He engaged in discussion with the Jews. Why would he do that? Because that's who Paul is. You see, these have, this cactus has little 
thorns on it. And I can touch this a hundred times, and it's always going to stick me. You know why? Because that's the form. And Paul, wherever he went, he was going teaching and evangelizing and discipling. You know why? Because that's who he was. He wasn't a Christian just on the outside. He was one inside. He wasn't a washed tomb. And so when he went to a place, he did what his form called him to do. I go and I preach and I teach. That's what he did. And though they asked him to stay for a longer time, he declined. But he said goodbye and said, I'll come back to you again if God wills. Then he set sail for Ephesus. On landing at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church. That's the church in Jerusalem. Because he's now going to begin, very soon, he's going to begin his third missionary journey. And he went down to Antioch. And now he's going to launch. I have a map up here, and you'll see where he went. He went down to Antioch, and after spending some time there, he set out, traveling through one place after another in the Galatian territory and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So you can see up in Antioch in the upper right, and he goes to Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, to Greece, and all back down to Jerusalem. That's his third missionary journey. And back then in the ancient world, that was a serious journey. Why would he do that? Because that's who he was. And what Jesus is saying there in Matthew, he's saying, look, you're going to do what you do because of what you are. And I'm going to know why you do it. I'm going to know the inside, not just the outside. I'm going to know if you're a follower of Christ. And again, the part of this message, it doesn't mean that we all have to hop on a boat and sail around the world as missionaries. Whatever we're called to be, we need to be that in the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever that is. But the question is, who are you? Are you in Christ or not? He was always about knowing Jesus. Always about helping other people to know Jesus Christ. That, it was was what drove Paul. When God got a hold of Paul on the road to Damascus, not only did it change Paul's life, not only did it change his eternity, it changed countless people who encountered Paul and all of their spiritual descendants down to this very day who read about Paul. That's the power of of living out who you really are in Christ. You see, the whitewashed tomb of this, again, this said mesquite tree, and it's not eventually, it's going to be known. And you might know people who have said that, or have maybe not explicitly, but have implied that they're spiritual giants among spiritual ants. God knows who belongs to him. It doesn't matter what it says on the outside. And so if I went down to the nursery and I bought this and I started applying water and up pops this, eventually up pops this cactus, I'm going to go back and say, you didn't sell me what you said you were selling me. And Jesus is saying, look, you're either known by me or you're not. There's no middle ground. And those that were casting out demons and doing miracles, one day they're going to realize that they didn't belong to to Christ. And Christ isn't saying, no, you have to live your life not knowing. He actually told us how to know. You're going to bear fruit in keeping with his name. But those who didn't, those who weren't known by Christ, those who on the outside say they're Christians, but on the inside they're not. They're not spiritual giants. Frauds. Fake. And ultimately, well, they fail. This cactus, for the miniature cactus it is, it's actually not a bad-looking cactus. It hasn't died yet. Give it enough time, it will... 
But for the thing that it is, it's, pretty, it's a pretty little cactus. Terrible mesquite tree. But nice little miniature cactus. We are called to be authentic followers of Jesus Christ and not in name only. And that's why it's so powerful to look at Paul. Because he, even though he was persecuting the church when he came to know Christ, what God saw in him was potential. And I I don't want you to think at this point like, wow, what am I doing? Maybe I'm in that 80% of the church that doesn't do any of the work of the church. I'm useless. Look, you're not useless. God sees it totally different. If you're a follower of Christ, you're not useless. You're full of potential. Full of potential. And this cactus, when it was a seedling, it was full of potential to be a cactus. And Paul, when he gave his life to the Lord, was so full of potential. And you know what he's doing? He's living out that potential. He's making it a reality. So let's take a look. Verse 24 of Acts 18. The second point is the original Apollos mission. So a Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man who was powerful in the use of scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught the things about Jesus accurately, although he knew only John's baptism, right? The baptism of repentance. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him home and explained the way of God to him more accurately. When he wanted to cross over to Achaia, the brothers wrote to the disciples, urging them to welcome him. After he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. And take a step back and think about what's happening here. So Apollos, he knows the baptism of John the Baptist. Baptism of repentance. And, he's, and Aquila and Priscilla hear him, and they take him home. What, here's what's amazing about this. Aquila and Priscilla, remember when they met Paul back earlier in Acts? Acts 1? They had been exiled from Rome by the emperor Claudius, and they fled Rome, and they went to Corinth, and Paul meets up with them. He finds them. He meets them. And you know what he does? Because he's a tent maker, and they're tent makers, he starts to disciple them. And they, they go out and live their life. And they hear Apollos and say, come to my house. You know what they didn't say is, hey, you need to come meet my pastor. You know what they did? Come to our house. We need to share the gospel with you. And then he goes and he starts to proclaim the gospel. That is in keeping with bearing fruit. Christ gets a hold of Paul. Paul disciples Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila and Priscilla, they disciple Apollos. Apollos goes out, and he proclaims the good news. That's in keeping with bearing fruit. They all had different roles. They all were doing their own thing, but they were authentic followers of Jesus Christ. Some were mesquite trees, some were redwood, some were cacti, but all of them were doing what they do as followers of Christ. So my question to you is, who are you? And are you bearing fruit in keeping with being a follower of Jesus Christ? Not what it says on the outside of the cup, but what is inside. Because see, that the person who sold me this, now they knew it was a cactus, and so did I. There was nothing wrong, but I'm, as an analogy, they, if they had said, well, redwood, and, and they put a seed in there of a cactus, thinking they'll never know. No, someday we'll know. We now know. And someday you'll know. Regardless of what we say on the outside. Friend, who are you? This is, this is the heartbeat of Paul's life. Take a look, Acts 19, to continue on. Then he entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months. This is the fourth point, which is the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So over three months, he's, he's speaking. 
engaging in discussion, trying to persuade them about the things of the kingdom of God. But when some became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd, that is, slandering the way of Jesus Christ, he withdrew from them and, not, and met separately with the disciples, conducting discussions every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this went on for two years, so that all the inhabitants of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the message about the Lord. Think about this. Paul was so in tune with the gospel. He was so in tune with Jesus Christ. He knew what to say. He knew when to pray, when to, when to stay, and when to skedaddle. Well, not skedaddle. That wasn't used until 1859. But he knew when to depart. He knew what to say, when to pray, when to stay, and when to go away. You know what? Because he was led by the Spirit. That should be so encouraging to us. That all the stuff he went through, he was so in tune with why he was created. That all the hardships, see, we hold him up, but back then he had multitudes that were putting him down. But he knew who he was in Christ. And probably a, a good measure of who we are in Christ in our day, the answer to the question, who are you, is are we persuaded by the arguments of the world against the holy standard of, of God? Have you found yourself wanting to compromise because the world says, look, this is the new way. Did God really say? And we kind of get swept away with the, the things of the world, the, the way of living today, the modern way. This is the cosmopolitan way. But God's holy standard doesn't change. See, Paul was never swayed. He never came off of the gospel because he belonged to Jesus Christ. And so he stays, and he's lecturing, and he's teaching, and he, this went on for two years. And then we get to the fifth point. We're, we're going to start this, and we're going to finish it up next Sunday because it's so important. The spiritual wasteland. Those like Paul, those like others, and they don't have to be famous, people who have lived and died, but they were authentic followers of Jesus. There, there is a, a portion of people here. And then there are there, these that they overtly persecute the church. But then there's a spiritual wasteland. Unknown by Jesus Christ. And not overtly used by Satan. This vast spiritual wasteland, unknown by Christ but not overtly used by Satan. You see, these people who were casting out demons, these people who were naming the name, they, weren't, they were unknown by Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees, the hypocrites, they would never say that they were overtly used by Satan. They were said they were people of God. But they were in this vast spiritual wasteland, unknown by Jesus Christ not overtly used by Satan. Useless in the kingdom and worthless to Satan. This vast spiritual wasteland. Let's take a look at this story, Acts 19, as we think about this question, who are you? Who are you? Because one day, when we breathe our last, one day, that is going to be the operative question. Who are you? You see, we, we often in, in evangelism, we, we often use this question, why would Jesus let you into his heaven? Or can, ima can you imagine one day Jesus asking you, why would I let you into my heaven? Actually, there's, there's a more fundamental question because he doesn't have to ask that question. He's going to ask a different question. Who are you? Who are you? Because the answer to that question 
means everything in eternity. Who are you? So let's take a look at this story, and then we'll unpack it a little bit, because I, I want us to meditate on this idea of worthfulness. Acts 19, starting in verse 11, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands, so that even face cloths or work aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, and the diseases left him, and the evil spirits came out of them. If you like to underline in your Bible, I want you to underline that because we're going to come back to this. This is really, really important. So evil spirits were cast out by Paul. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. These people, these are the one, they are in the spiritual wasteland, the spiritual no man's land as you're going to see. They're trying to cast out demons, evil spirits. So they're not for Satan. But they're not known by Jesus. Take a look. So these itinerant Jewish exorcists attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches, seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, which is a really sad commentary on that family. He's a Jewish high priest, and his seven sons are going about doing this, trying to commit fraud in the name of the Lord. The evil spirit, now listen to this, one of the greatest lines of any evil spirit in God's word. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? They are in the spiritual wasteland. Even the evil spirit said, I know Jesus. Now, they're not saved, obviously. They're evil. They're of Satan. But but they know of Jesus. And they've heard of Paul. But who are you? Who are you to cast me out? They're in the spiritual wasteland. They're not known by Christ. They're not being used by Satan, not overtly, because they're trying to cast out an evil spirit, but they're in this place thinking they could do it, and how many people, even people who call themselves Christians, they dwell in that place, but yet they can't say the Jesus I know. They had to say the Jesus that Paul preached. But who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit leapt on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them, so they ran out of that house naked and wounded. Now take a look. That's verse 16. If you would, go back up to verse 12. So that even face cloths or work aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, and even the evil spirits came out of them. These evil spirits that were being cast out by Paul, how many of them attacked and put the beat down on Paul? Zero. But they do to those in the spiritual wasteland. We have no recorded incident of any demon possessed man or demonic or evil spirit cast out by Paul putting the beat down like this on Paul. But we do of those who named Jesus but didn't know Jesus. There's something in here, there's some truth in here that we, we pull this out and say, it matters if Jesus knows us. Sure, they can say the, the Jesus that Paul preaches. But the evil spirits put the beat down. We'll, we'll look at that. And so the question that they asked the, the, the brothers, the seven brothers, these seven sons of Sceva, who are you? We just take that question and we ask it of ourselves. Who am I really? Am I in Christ? Is Christ in me? And it's not about what's written on the outside. It's what's on the inside that matters. And for some reason, the evil spirit knew 
these people did not belong to Jesus Christ. Who are you? And in the world right now, in our life right now, we need to ask ourselves that question, who am I? Because if you've been tempted, as we all have been tempted, to go along with the, the things of the world, even in little things, the shows you watch, the movies you see, the language, the, the things that you just allow into your, your mind through the TV, or any other type of thing like that. Not the big stuff. Set aside the big stuff of the world, but just the, the little compromises the million compromises in the course of a year. Who am I really? Because if I belong to God, if I'm known by Christ, the world will never convince me that God's holy standard is wrong. If I am of Christ and Christ is in me, if I am in the world but not of the world, the world will never convince me to update, to edit any part of the holiness of God. But if I'm a Christian in name only, redwood tree but inside secretly I'm just a little cactus, the world will push the church around. Because inside, we're full of dead men's bones. And one day, we will hear Jesus say, you were in that spiritual wasteland. Oh, sure, you did all kinds of things. In my name. But who are you? A follower of Christ doesn't have to go on trips like Paul. But a follower of Christ is not one in name only, but on the inside is committed to our holy God. Who are you? The greatest question you and I could ask ourselves, and we all have to ask it. It's not just, oh, the preacher saying, no, it's all of us have to ask that question. This Advent is a great opportunity. We just happen to be at this section of Scripture at Christmas. It's a great time to ask, who are you? Really and truly, who are you? Now, and I want to wrap this up with some really good news. Well, I think it's good news. Even if to this point in your life, you felt like, Lord, I really haven't been producing fruit. I know I belong to you. You are, you might have, you might even take stock of your testimony and say, you know, I've been kind of worth, worth I've been kind of useless. Friend, I can tell you, if you belong to God, you are not worthless even if you haven't allowed God to use you all the way, if you have been created by God, which you have been, you are not worthless in the kingdom of God. We may feel a little useless sometimes, but never ever think that you're worthless. Usefulness comes from function, but worthfulness comes from form. And if God formed you, created you, you are infinitely worthful. The question is, are you being useful? But never doubt your worthfulness to your creator. And with that, I can ask that question, who am I? And if I can say, I am God's. As long as I have breath and a brain, 
I can live out the function for which he created this form, which is to be a follower of Jesus Christ and to reach and to teach and to love and to be an ambassador of mercy. Wherever you find yourself in your walk right now, you are infinitely worthful because our Savior died for you. He was born for this, to die for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And you are infinitely worthful. You are full of worth. And the church is filled with people who are worthful and full of worth. Even if we look at our life and say, I haven't done what God has really called me to do, but yet I have breath and a brain. And I know that today, from this point forward, Jesus Christ can be my all in all. And I can go from this place and I can live out that whether I'm a redwood, I'm a pine tree, I'm a mesquite tree, whatever it is, an oak tree, I can live out that purpose because I'm worthful in the name of Jesus Christ, in the mind of Jesus Christ. If you belong to Christ, you are infinitely worthful, Jerry. That even if you were the only one, Christ would have died for you. Michael, he would have died for you. Nathan, he would have died for you. So let us never say, I'm only a cactus. But I am a cactus, and I shall act like a cactus. I am a follower of Christ, and I will live like a follower of Christ. And I will never let the world redefine the holiness of God. Who are you? I pray you are in Jesus, and he's in you. Will you join with me in standing? Let's go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father. This question, who are you? This in mind, this mass of spiritual reality of people who say, you know, I think I'll make it because I've never really hurt anybody. Or I think I'll go to heaven because the, my good will outweigh the bad, I hope. And everything else like that is all part of the spiritual wasteland, this mass of humanity that simply isn't known by Christ. And my prayer, Lord, just like after the first service when that young man came forward to give his life to Christ or at the start of the service, the baptism, a man who rededicated his life. My, Lord, my prayer is that all of us in this place, in the sound of my voice, we would ask ourselves that question, who am I? Do I belong to God? And, and does Christ know me? And if there's someone here who's not known by Christ and they know it, Lord, my prayer is that after I close in prayer and dismiss it, as I stand here, they would come forward and say, I want to know. And I want to produce fruit in keeping with who I am in Christ. It's only by God's grace. But Lord, we ask that you would pour out that grace right now on this place. And if there's somebody who doesn't know the answer to the question, who am I? They would settle that by the prompting of your spirit. Lord, I pray blessing and, and joy and peace over all of us as we prepare to depart. That we would meditate on this scripture, these seven sons of Sceva, who thought, thought they can proclaim the, the name of Christ that Paul preached. But even the evil spirit asked, who are you? Lord, I ask we go in peace and the joy of the season. We come back next Sunday as we finish looking at this particular scripture and our worth in your eyes as your creation. Bless us as we go. And if there's someone who... Lord, is being prompted by your spirit to give their life to you, to rededicate their life. I ask that you come forward after this, after this prayer concludes. In Christ's name, I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed. I'm going to be here. If God's stirring in your heart, we can pray for you. I would love for you to come up and pray for you.